Welcome to the first video in a long series of videos on Fermat's last theorem. Today we're going to look at an introductory discussion of the theorem, and we're also going to give a full proof for exponent four. So what is the motivation for Fermat's last theorem? I think the best motivation, or one of the best motivations, is your elementary number theory course. You learn in such a course that the equation x squared plus y squared equals z squared has infinitely many solutions over the natural numbers. We call these solutions Pythagorean triples because each has entries which constitute integer side lengths of a right triangle by the Pythagorean theorem. If I give you such a triple, A, B, C, then if the entries have greatest common divisor D that's bigger than one, we can cancel a D squared from both sides of the equation to produce a simpler Pythagorean triple. And so to describe all Pythagorean triples, I only have to describe the so-called primitive Pythagorean triples, which are those triples that have pairwise co-prime entries. You might wonder why I'm allowed to reduce that far down. Why am I allowed to only consider triples that have pairwise co-prime entries instead of just co-prime entries? That's very simple. It's because, as I'll let you check, if any two entries have greatest common divisor d bigger than one, then d automatically divides the third entry as well because of the Pythagorean equation. So here's the classification of Pythagorean triples that you learn in your number theory class. Given co-prime integers m and n of opposite parity with zero less than n less than m, the quantities a, which is m squared minus n squared, b, which is 2mn, and c, which is m squared plus n squared, those constitute a primitive Pythagorean triple. That's a very easy calculation. You can prove that on your own very simply. What's remarkable is that the converse is true. If I give you a primitive Pythagorean triple ABC, then exactly one of a or b is even. And if it's b that's even, if it's b that's even, this triple arises from a unique pair MN satisfying these properties. If it's instead A that's even, you just swap the formulas for A and B. So we've completely and succinctly classified all Pythagorean triples by very simple equations. We can parameterize them easily and there are infinitely many interesting solutions to the equation X squared plus Y squared equals Z squared over the natural numbers. So that makes the following theorem incredibly shocking. For Mo's last theorem, if n is an integer that's at least three, then if a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n, where a, b, and c are integers, then at least one of a, b, or c is zero. In other words, if you take this equation here, what we call the Fermat equation with exponent two, which has infinitely many interesting solutions over the positive integers. By interesting, I mean all of the entries are non-zero, okay? And they're all succinctly and easily parameterizable. The second you increase this exponent up to three, you lose most all of those solutions. You go from infinitely many solutions to only finitely many solutions, okay? Which solutions? The solutions that have at least one entry zero. So you lose all of the interesting solutions. You lose that nice parameterization you have. And what's even more interesting is that you never recover no matter how large you make this exponent. You always can never get back what you had when the exponent was two. You completely destroy the solution set and make it utterly non-interesting. Okay, so we're gonna call the equation x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n, the Fermat equation of exponent n. And we're gonna refer to its hypothetical integer solutions ABC satisfying ABC is non-zero, the non-trivial integer solutions. Now we know there aren't any of these by the theorem, but to prove the theorem at various steps, we'll have to assume there is such a solution. Okay, so we're gonna to wanna to have a name for such a solution. And then the solutions A, B, C over the integers where A, B, C is zero, we'll just call those the trivial integer solutions, should we need to refer to them. First, let's make some easy reductions. If the theorem holds for exponent D, then it holds for any exponent N with D dividing N. I'll let you check that, it's very easy. But every integer N at least three is divisible by four or an odd prime, which I'll also let you check. And so if you put these two statements together, you see that it suffices to prove for Mott's last theorem for odd prime exponents and for exponent four. We're gonna prove exponent four in this video. Let's make another reduction. If A, B, C is a non-trivial integer solution to the Fermat equation with exponent n at least three, we can actually assume that A, B, and C are positive integers, not just arbitrary non-zero integers. Indeed, if n is even, if the exponent is even, this is a trivial statement because if any of the entries are negative, we can simply change their signs and then the even exponent will kill any negatives that show up as a result. So assume N is odd. Okay, if C is negative, at least one of A or B is negative. Let's say A is negative. Okay, I'll let you check this. If B is negative as well, then all three entries are negative. So we can factor in negative out of both sides of the Fermat equation. 
and proceed with a new non-trivial integer solution whose entries are positive. Okay, if instead B is positive, then I have C negative, A negative, B positive. So then I can just rewrite the Fermat equation as A to the N equals C to the N plus negative B to the N because N is, e, uh, N is odd. And so again, I can, these are all negative. Okay, so I can factor a negative out of each side. And again, I can proceed with a different non-trivial integer solution to the Fermat equation that has all positive entries. Okay, so the only other possibility is that C was positive to start with. But then you can check easily that at most one of A or B is negative. Let's say A is negative and let's say B is positive. Okay, then just rewrite the Fermat equation as A to the N plus negative C to the N equals negative B to the N. And again, all three of these are negative. So you can factor a negative out of both sides, cancel away and proceed with a different non-trivial integer solution to the Fermat equation of exponent n that now has all positive entries. And so without loss of generality, you may as well just assume all three of these entries are positive to begin with if you have a non-trivial integer solution to the Fermat equation with exponent n at least three. Okay, let's give a full proof for exponent four. We're going to have to prove Fermat's last theorem separately for n equals three and n equals four anyway before uh, delving into the proof of the general case, so we're not wasting our time here. N equals three is much harder, and we'll do that probably in two videos over the next two videos starting tomorrow. Okay, here's the proof for N equals four. It's due to Fermat himself. It's the only proof that he gave, circa 1640. Suppose that we have found a non-trivial primitive integer solution, ABC to the Fermat equation, X to the fourth plus Y to the fourth equals Z to the fourth. So we're gonna proceed by contradiction. We're gonna give a logical contradiction to this assumption. By considering this equation mod four, we can see that we can assume A is even. That's because squares mod four are zero or one, depending on whether we're squaring an even number or an odd number respectively. So I'll let you check that you can assume using that fact that A is even, and you should prove this fact also. Okay, we can also assume that all entries are positive as we discussed above. Now, ABC is a primitive non-trivial integer solution to X to the fourth plus Y to the fourth equals Z to the fourth, right? So A squared, B squared, C squared is a primitive Pythagorean triple. By the classification of Pythagorean triples, primitive Pythagorean triples, we can find co-prime integers m and n of opposite parity with zero less than m less than m, such that a squared is 2mn, b squared is m squared minus n squared, and c squared is m squared plus n squared. If you rearrange this middle equation, you get b squared plus n squared equals m squared. So you have another solution to the Fermat equation with exponent two given by bmn. But remember, m and n are co-prime. So BMN is actually a primitive Pythagorean triple. I'll let you check the primitivity yourself, but it's easy using this fact. Okay, now M is either even or odd, right? We'll dispense with the case M is even later. Let's assume M is odd for now. Recall M and M have opposite parity, so N must be even. Okay, so BMN is a primitive Pythagorean triple. M is odd, N is even. Let's use the theory of primitive Pythagorean triples again to find co-prime integers M1 and N1 of opposite parity with zero less than N1 less than M1 such that n, our even guy, is 2m1n1, b is m1 squared minus n1 squared, and m is m1 squared plus n1 squared. Perfect. Now, a squared, as you recall, is 2mn, but now I have these new formulas for m and n. I can plug those into this equation here to find that a squared is 4m1n1 times m1 squared plus n1 squared. That means m1n1, m1 squared plus n1 squared, this guy here is a square. That's because a is even, so a squared divided by four is the square of an integer. Check the details. Okay, by Euclid's lemma, a prime that divides m1, n1 also divides m1 or n1, but it can't divide both because these are co-prime integers. And so it can't divide m1 squared plus n1 squared either. Well, that means there is no prime that divides both m1, n1 and m1 squared plus n1 squared. In other words, m1, n1 and m1 squared plus n1 squared are co-prime. They have GCD1. Perfect. Their product is a square, right? And they're co-prime. So each of them themselves are squares. So m1 squared plus n1 squared and M1 and N1 are squares, but M1 and N1 are also co-prime and their product is a square. So M1 and N1 must be squares as well. I'm using the fundamental theorem of arithmetic repeatedly here. Okay, fine. Let's write M1 equals A prime squared and N1 equals B prime squared for some A prime, B prime positive integers. I can assume they're positive because of the squares here. Okay, well then what's A prime to the fourth plus B prime to the fourth? It's by definition M1 squared plus N1 squared, but remember, m1 squared plus n1 squared is a square. So that means a prime to the fourth plus b prime to the fourth is a square. Perfect. So what have we shown? We've shown that if a and b are positive co-prime integers with a to the fourth plus b to the fourth is square because it's c to the fourth, which is c squared squared, then we can find a new pair of positive co-prime integers, 
A prime and B prime. Why were A prime and B prime co prime? That's because M1 and N1 were co prime, and A prime and B prime are given in terms of M1 and N1. Okay? Such that A prime to the fourth plus B prime to the fourth is a square. In other words, if you give me an A and B that are co prime positive, such that the sum of their fourth powers is a square, I can get you a new pair of positive co prime integers such that the sum of their fourth powers is a square. Who cares? Well, the key is this equation here. A prime to the fourth plus B prime to the fourth is M1 squared plus N1 squared, which is M, but M is a positive integer. So it's strictly less than M squared plus N squared because N is also a positive integer, but M squared plus N squared is C squared, which is less than or equal to C to the fourth, which is by assumption, A to the fourth plus B to the fourth. And so the upshot is A prime to the fourth plus B prime to the fourth is strictly less than A to the fourth plus B to the fourth. And the point is, now you can start the procedure all over again with your new solution to the Fermat equation of exponent four, A prime, B prime, whatever its third entry is. Okay, but that establishes an infinite, strictly descending sequence of positive integers, the sums of the fourth powers of the A and the B entries, all satisfying the same property, namely that they're squares. That's impossible. You can't have an in a strictly decreasing infinite sequence of positive integers, right? So that's a contradiction. So that means there was no non-trivial integer solution to the Fermat equation of exponent four to begin with. This type of contradiction is called contradiction by infinite descent. Whenever you produce an infinite strictly descending uh, sequence of positive integers, that's called contradiction by infinite descent. Okay, now, if you remember, to prove this, we assumed M was odd. So if M, was, if M is odd, we get a contradiction, but what if M is even? So what if M is even? Well, M can't actually be even because if it was, and you consider the equation B squared plus N squared equals M squared mod four, you would find that B and N have to be even as well. Um, but the triple BMN was a primitive Pythagorean triple. So it can't be that BM and N are all even because then they would all be divisible by two contradicting primitivity. Okay, so in no case is there a non-trivial integer solution to the Fermat equation with exponent four. We have our contradiction. We are done with the proof in exponent four. Now, over the next two videos, starting tomorrow, I'll look at the case n equals three, which is much more difficult. So I'll see you then. Thanks for watching.